Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we are good to go. Um, my name is Chris Butler. I'm the chair of ICMP. And as well as having that pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome you um, this afternoon. This is a continuation of our digital series. It's the first of 2021. Um, but I think we are close to racking up about a thousand delegates to this series, which is a testament to the um, I guess the quality of the topics and the and the interest in in, in the subjects that we're covering. Um, as you know, I hope ICMP represents over ninety percent of the world's music publishers. Uh, we work on behalf of uh, majors and indies, um, and we have a global um, sphere activity. Um, our industry is driven more and more um, by digital music provision. Um, uh, the industry has relationships with literally hundreds of digital services across Europe and further afield. Um, and hence, digital policy is something that we particularly engage in wherever it arises worldwide. Um, and one of the big issues, of course, is, is today's topic, the European Digital Services Act. Uh, so we're, we're fortunate to have high level speakers, uh, political speakers from the parliament and from the presidency, um, and also from our own board, uh, Gertz von Einem. Um, and the, uh, the session will be introduced and moderated by our DG, uh, Johnny Phelan. So um, thank you to the panelists um, and thank you. To, uh, we have a global audience beyond Europe for today's event. Uh, I can't see all of you, but I know it's um, uh, a, a long list. So thank you for taking the time to spend with us today. And I hope you get as much as, as you can out of, the, of, out of the coming hour. So thank you very much and over to you, Johnny. Thanks very much indeed, Chris, and uh, a real warm welcome to everybody. It's uh, still unfortunate that 2021 starts with us being unable to meet in person, but this is the next best thing. And uh, we're really glad to see a sold out audience for today's uh, topic on the Digital Services Act package. So a very warm welcome to everyone. We do have a hard stop uh, at quarter to the hour, so we're going to rattle through this as, as quickly as we can. Uh, there are lots of interesting topics to get through. I just want to point out some housekeeping. Uh, please note the difference between the chat box and the questions and answers box. Uh, we do encourage all attendees to engage in the questions and answers box on the center bottom. Do ask your questions to the panels, panelists, and we will unmute you to ask your questions directly. You can do that throughout the session. Uh, we will uh, try to introduce these questions throughout the session or indeed stack them at the end. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. And now to the introductions. Uh, we're really thoroughly delighted to be joined by Mr. Alex Saliba, uh, the member of the European Parliament with the S&D Socialist Group. He's also a, a key politician on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee. And he has been the Parliament's rapporteur on the recommendations to the Commission on the Digital Services Act legislation. I don't think there's anyone in the Parliament who's been more at the forefront of this issue. So we're delighted to have you joining us today. There we go. I think you're live now. Okay, perfect. Sorry, but I couldn't amuse myself. Thanks for the invite. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, we are also delighted to be joined by Mr. Ricardo Castaneda. He is the lead on digital and telecoms policy, not just for the Portuguese government in Brussels, but is currently also the coordinator on all of these digital issues for the EU Council Presidency uh, and the Council for all of our attendees, as you know, because you hear me saying it every day by email, is the key institution gathering all 27 member state governments together. So it's a, a crucial role which uh, uh, Mr. Castaneda plays in this legislation as it goes forward in the Council over the next year. And we're delighted to have you today. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure. And uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, by the way, the video is really cool, your initial video. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, glad to have the hat tip. It's all fully licensed and uh, and properly taken care of by our, our music publishers. So thank you also to APL Publishing for providing the music. We also are joined, certainly not last but not least, uh, by uh, Mr. Götz von Einem, a familiar face to many of the attendees today, no doubt. Uh, Götz is Managing Director at uh, Peer Music for Germany, Switzerland and Austria. He's also uh, a lead executive on the world's largest independent music publishing company, Peer Music, and indeed is an ICMP Global Board member for many years. Uh, and if I may say, one of our finest uh, legal minds in the industry. So a warm welcome to you, Götz. Thank you very much for having me. Great, great. Well, thanks. And uh, so let's get straight into it. Um, to set the today context for today's discussion, this is a tremendously complex and multifaceted piece of legislation. Uh, let's just bring up some headlines for the concepts which connect this legislation to our industry. Uh, first of all, many of you will be seeing in newspapers around Europe this political premise, which is at the heart of it, and that is that what is illegal offline should be illegal online. Uh, we would say that that has been true for many years, but the reality and practice is that it has been very hard for the music industry to make that a reality. And the Digital Services Act provides the opportunity for that to become true, and we will hear more from our speakers today as, why, as to why that's important. Safe harbours, a constant theme within our industry over the last 20 years. Article 17 was one step towards uh, clarifying small number of the types of services which cannot have safe harbours, user uploaded content sites, of course, like YouTube, Facebook, TikTok. But the DSA will also tackle this issue as it revises the Commerce Directive. Scope, as I mentioned, Article 17 uh, does tackle a small number of services, but the DSA looks to expand beyond that. And this is building upon that political premise of what is illegal offline should be illegal online. For our industry, we want to make sure that search engines, P2P, and all sorts of digital services are obeying the law. Tools for whenever companies or services do not obey the law. Uh, for us, our premise is that what should not go up must stay down. So for us, what is illegal content is unlicensed content. And we will discuss today some of the tools that the legislation proposes. Transparency at the heart of our industry, uh, it's day-to-day -day priority for all of our companies. And there are key provisions within the law, such as the Know Your Business Customer, which Mr. Saliba has been championing in the European Parliament. And to that specific theme, we will come to uh, from the outset. And the Know Your Business Customer, uh, we look forward to you explaining Mr. Saliba before any of our companies try to sign it as a band. So you'll have to explain precisely what that uh, concept is. Um, my, uh, my old history teacher used to say that nothing is too obvious to state. So I'm going to start right at the top uh, with Mr. Saliba. Can I ask you the very simple question? Why does Europe need a Digital Services Act law? Simple. Europe needs the uh, DSA and the MA to ultimately take back control uh, in the digital ecosystem. We are in a situation whereby our regulation is dictated by a piece of legislation which has been there for the past 20 years, the e-commerce directive, which was created in a day and time, although uh, it resisted and weathered um, a lot of challenges. It was created in a day and time whereby the challenges that we have today, challenges of big tech platforms, which have become the new public utilities of our time, didn't even exist. So during the past uh, years, our court, our legislators were very creative to try to go around the fundamental principles of the e-commerce directive. Some of those principles, which are still relevant to basically shape them for the exigencies of today's realities. I think that this is a great opportunity, great opportunity to move forward fundamental, um, fundamental ideas to take back this control, take back control by 
defining who the systemic operators in the ecosystem are, those gatekeepers, which are causing so much, so much issues for startups, for scale-ups, for this uncompetitive behavior, which we cannot tackle through traditional competition law. These instruments are important to move forward a harmonized notice and action system, which today uh, is governed by a situation of a lot of patchwork, a lot of different initiatives being undertaken in different member states, the Nets DG in Germany, the initiatives which are ultimately taking shape also as we speak in a number of member states, which can also continue to jeopardize the harmonization and the doing away with patchwork. Therefore, we need a harmonized um, horizontal notice and action system. And also other important pillars, such as the know your business customer principle, the extraterritoriality element that we want to introduce here so that those third country sellers, those uh, who are targeting directly our users, our consumers, our European digital single market must also abide by our rules. And also um, principles such as those principles on advertising. We all know that advertising today has become the primary business model for these big tech companies. So they thrive on, um, on ads and targeted ads. Therefore, we need also to take back control there. So there are a number of challenges we have. Uh, and, and, and I conclude with this point. The DSA and DMA are not the silver bullet to solve all the complex issues that we have at hand. But at the same time, I think it's a good start. It's a good proposal. These are two good proposals from the commission to start tackling some of the biggest challenges that we have at hand. But we must and we should be more ambitious and that will be the push from the European Parliament to continue pushing forward to ultimately, and you started with this principle, to ultimately have this level playing field of what is illegal offline should also be considered to be illegal online too. This was a fundamental pillar of our report, and this should be the fundamental guiding line for the Council, Commission, and Parliament during the next months that will lead us uh, for the negotiations on the these two fundamentally important instruments that will shape the internet for, for and the digital single market for the next 10, 15, 20 years ahead. Fantastic, that's a, a superb wrap up. Uh, a couple of very interesting points you made there is uh, on safe harbors and about the e-commerce legislation, which has been around for 20 years. There's sometimes a misconception that our industry wants to revise the safe harbors themselves. Of course, they were designed for telcos and for the com companies working behind the scenes of the internet. They should have those liability exemptions, but indeed the active platforms, which are actually using and engaging and advertising and profiting of music and copyright protected content shouldn't have access to those safe harbors. Uh, harmonization, of course, is a great tool because it's cross-border, it's European, and very helpful for particularly our smaller companies and our independent company members. Um, if I may, Mr. Sleeper, in your report, um, which was uh, an excellent wrap-up of all of those topics that you mentioned, uh, you underlined the importance of the new digital, cultural, and creative industries and the of the added value brought by digital technologies. Um, I was just wondering if you could explain further how you see the interplay between digital and creativity, uh, creative industries and this law. Is it an adversarial relationship as you perceive it in the parliament? Is it a, you know, we would perceive it as very much an interplay between digital and creative industries. How do you see that relationship and what are the challenges within the parliament uh, to tackle and regulate digital technologies? So when you look at our creative industry, our creative industry plays a very important role when it comes to the ecosystem and some of the major challenges that we have when it comes to our creative industries should and must be tackled through, through the DSA and also through the DMA. So first of all, and this is also linking to a point that you were, that you were making, I, I believe, I firmly believe that Although when it comes to the safe harbor provisions under Article 12 and 14, and this is what also the Commission is saying, there will be a replication of what we have in the e-commerce directive, a copy and paste exercise that will be put uh, in, the new, in the new proposal that we are discussing in the DSA. But at the same time, there are other instruments, other instruments which are so important for the creative industry, 
such as the notice and action and the prompt action that is needed when um, content which is defined as illegal, um, this content should be taken down and appropriate safeguards should be in place. So this content is removed online from the online ecosystem. So that is one point. But I think that for the creative industry, the know your business customer, this transparency that is so important and fundamentally important, this shame, because it, 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 it's, a, it's a total shame that is in this day and age, uh, when, when we are so reliant on this digital infrastructure, we have a situation whereby uh, our, our, there are European companies which are shedding and giving shelter to uh, companies which are, and, and, and uh, even companies which are uh, found in third country, uh, in third countries which are not found in the European Union, but they are giving shelter to these, com to these companies to shed under the anonymity umbrella. And we already under the e-commerce directive, we already have article five, which already puts an obligation to give out correct information and not to hide behind this anonymity to infringe basic and fundamental rules, including the protection of intellectual property rights. Um, and and th 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 that is one of the main points also behind the Know Your Business Customer principle. So the Know Your Business Customer principle introducing introduces that verification element. So it is strengthening what we already have under Article 5 of the Fund Commerce Directive so that this verification element, because ultimately we, are, we were seeing during the past exercises that we did, past consultations that we did with a number of industries, a number of stakeholders, a number of NGOs, that although there is this element that correct information should be gathered when thousands of euros are wired every week to European companies, um, but, but ultimately this verification was missing. And the Know Your Business Customer mm -hmm. principle, and that is why we are pushing so hard on the Commission to be ambitious when it comes to the Know Your Business Customer and not restrict it only to uh, online marketplaces, uh, this should be a principle which should apply to all service providers uh, in the ecosystem because ultimately it will solve, if we restrict the Know Your Business Customer principle, it will solve only part of the problem, but other issues, other challenges that are faced also by the um, creative industries will still be there. So I believe that there are a number of good proposals to basically uh, make this level playing field, correct this imbalance that we have. Um, and ultimately, there are good proposals which, which will definitely benefit our, our creative industries so that they can also scale up uh, in our, in our, in throughout, throughout our, 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 uh, our union. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And that Know Your Business customer for our industry has been is a tremendously important provision for tackling uh, commercial scale infringements and piracy. And uh, we really thank you for making that a cornerstone of your reports and your continued push. Uh, Mr. Castaneda, if I may go to square one, uh, why do we need a Digital Services Act? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to start saying that um, I agree with, I would say, almost of everything that uh, Alex just mentioned. And this, it, it shows um, our uh, starting point uh, between two institutions uh, regarding the DSA. Um, several of us uh, participated and uh, we had a, a very active role on the discussions on the, the review of the EVMS, also the copyright reform. And it was not exactly the same thing. Uh, we were quite uh, far apart and, uh, and also uh, the stakeholders were not uh, uh, engaged. Um, and this is a very important aspect. It means that there is a wide consensus among institutions, industry, civil society on the opportunity and the relevance of creating a regulatory framework for the digital economy um, with the view to making um, digital platforms accountable in their relationship with both consumers, users, and also other uh, business customers. And governments too, by the way, uh, what's happening in Australia uh, shows um, uh, how relevant it is uh, also the relation between those platforms and, uh, and gov's. 
Um, let me emphasize uh, on top of what Alex already said, uh, there is a very important geopolitical aspect on the SA2. It will be the first legislation to establish um, a regime of rules and responsibility for platforms, which puts the EU once again on the regulatory front line with a view to promote a level playing field that is absolutely essential for operators in the digital single market, uh, including, of course, your sector, the creative sector. Um, uh, and this is very, very important, especially because the DSA uh, or the regime that the DSA wants to establish will be precisely an alternative to the more relaxed regime uh, of the U.S. Communications Decency Act. Um, and this is very uh, important, especially, and we cannot talk about the absence of any kind of regime and obligations in China, for example. And uh, this is something that's also important because it's strongly linked with the concept of open strategic autonomy of, in, in Europe, which also uh, is not exactly the subject of our conversation today, but it's something that we should add also have, have, uh, have in mind. Let me then emphasize another uh, important aspect, which is the DSA goes beyond the harmonization of the liability exemption rules and introduce a very important new framework of due diligence uh, uh, online um, for online platforms obligations. Um, and look, when we, take a, when we think that uh, the very large online platforms, which are really uh, important targets of this uh, regulatory exercise, they need to present um, risk management and independent audits, uh, recommender si have in place recommender systems, data access for vetted researchers, data access to supervisory authorities, a compliance officer, further transparency reporting, all these kind of new diligence uh, obligations are, you cannot tell differently, very, very important. And of course, uh, it will for sure help to get that level playing field, which is one of the most important goals of this reform. Yeah, that's it's tremendously important. And uh, I think that modern day politics and the EU legal framework is reflecting the music industry. It's a digitized global industry post Article 17. Uh, uh, Chris Butler and our board were in Australia uh, shortly afterwards, where the Australian government were looking directly at what the EU was doing in terms of leveling the playing field for licensing of online uh, copyright protected content such as music and looking at Article 17, Canada is doing likewise, the new Biden administration is revising its position. So that's, uh, I think, emphasizes the importance of what Europe is doing and for our industry, particularly our smaller independent companies, having that level playing field means that they can go in with equal clout to these big tech platforms and ask for fair licenses and fair practices. Um, and just on that perspective, um, Gus, of course, you're on a daily basis leading um, uh, business for the uh, world's largest independent music publisher. Um, how do you see this issue from your perspective? Um, how, how, why do we need a digital services act? And indeed, how important is digital simply to your day-to-day -day business? Well, um... You know that as a music publisher, our, our main aim is to foster songwriters, to discover them and then make sure that they can create music and we promote it, we license it, and we make sure that uh, they get paid for it. And I think, um, I think it was Alex who already mentioned how important the creative industry is in Europe. I mean, you know that they really contribute a lot uh, to the um, uh, European revenues and it's uh, the, music industry has been basically the first industry that has been hit by piracy and uh, mp3 and i don't need to mention all these buzzwords and but not only were we the first to be hit but we were also the first industry who actually established a way out we started licensing um and i'm i think we can proudly say that we've been able to license over 200 services uh, to date, and that's in a cooperation between the label side, but also collecting societies, publishers, um, everyone involved. So I think we can say that we have done our homework in that respect, and we have done everything that is possible under the legal regime that we have at the moment to actually um, legalize the usage of music. And it's important to stress, I think, 
that our aim is and was always to license and make music available. It's, uh, we are not blocking, we're not doing anything like this. We want to license. And I think in this respect, we also established quite good relationships on the licensing front, also with, um, with the big platforms and the small ones as well, um, but especially those big platforms that we're talking about here as well. Um, and I think then we, we saw the copyright directive in Article 17 as the first step to actually uh, come to a level playing field with those services who are mainly, um, or which, or whose uh, business model is mainly based on music services like YouTube or TikTok. Um, but what we discover every day is that there's still a lot of music out there which is illegal and illegal in our sense is unlicensed. And the, the issue is that we have under the current regime, we do not have any legal means actually to, um, to get them to license um, because they are, they find those loopholes or the, as like I said in the beginning, I mean, the current regime is 20 years old. It's probably outdated. It wasn't made for these kind of services. And so, I mean, we're talking about services that every one of us uses every day, uh, like search engines, like app stores, and everywhere you can find music. And it's not their main business, maybe, but illegal music, as we would call it, is available there. And that's why it's tremendously important for us that we do something on that front as well, and that we modernize the uh, European legislation in that respect. And our, I mean, our aim is clear. We want those services to be liable in that respect, um, which also includes that they actually take responsibility for their users, that they know who their users are. That's the um, know your business customer rules. Um, it's also obviously the second point, notice and stay down. If we notify them and say, this is something that's illegal, um, it cannot be our task to find those illegal usages over and over and over again, because I mean, in the end, everything is based on copyright and copyright is an exclusive right and it works with licenses and that's what we do. And uh, so it cannot be that there's tons and thousands of uh, illegal content out there and no one, uh, and we don't have any means to actually tackle them. And then the last bit is obviously then uh, transparency. Um, and I'm not, I'm really not saying that all these search engines and so Google or whatever, that they're all uh, illegal services. That's not what I'm saying, but they provide the means for illegal services to spread and to foster. And that's what we need to stop. And that's our aim here in this discussion, I guess. Thank you very much, Gertz. I mean, certainly with um, uh, music services such as YouTube having 2.1 billion monthly active users, we show the, the scale of the of the challenge. Article 17 tackles those, but indeed the DSA expands the scope of that. Uh, just on the illegal content aspect, if I may ask all of the panelists to intervene, um, uh, Alex, you mentioned the notice in action. Uh, the terminology is very important here, of course. Uh, within Article 17, it was a word first notice and stay down uh, clause, i.e., as Gertz just mentioned, when a rights holder says that is my content, you're not entitled to it, it should stay down. Uh, this hasn't been secured within the Commission proposal. Uh, we are, of course, working on a daily basis with national governments and, and with MEPs to particularly give information about how the industry doesn't want to block. It simply wants to license and have the tools enabled to enable licensing. Can you speak a little bit about yep. how you see the Parliament challenges on that regard, please? This is a one of the most sensitive discussions that we had leading up also to our proposal. Our proposal leading to ultimately the Commission's proposals on the um, 15th of December last year. Um, and we were very clear also in our in our in our proposal that we are speaking here, and I made reference to that to that to notice and action and not notice action and state. Why did we take that direction? We took, we took that direction because when we're speaking about the DSA, we are speaking about a horizontal instrument. When we're speaking about copyright, you are speaking directly of uh, interests that are being directly affected 
for example, the, the, the creator's interests and, and, and copyrighted content and intellectual property rights. But when we are speaking of content which is regulated by the Digital Services Act, we are speaking of a larger umbrella. And our, our point is that when we are speaking of state downs in such a horizontal instrument, uh, this, le le this legislation could affect very negatively fundamental rights of EU citizens. When companies receive a notification, they should and they must be obliged to take actions. And the action um, to take should, of course, depend on the type uh, of illegal content or activity that is concerned. But at the same time, if we introduce, and this was the big discussion that we had within the European, the, the, the Internal Market Committee, and the other shadows and also the members of the internal market committee. I think that the biggest threat for us to introduce stay downs in a horizontal instrument was to have, first of all, uh, a lot of content, which is uh, legal content, um, which is being taken down. Uh, so over removal of content and ultimately the danger of uh, affecting negatively fundamental rights of EU citizens. It's not an issue that we are not recognizing the challenges that you have as an industry, as creative industry, when it comes to content, which continuously continues to be uploaded. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I can totally understand your argumentation when you are saying that stay downs can filter that content, which has already been taken down so that uh, it does not, it does not appear again. But at the same time, this for us, since this is a horizontal instrument, we believe that it will pose issues when it comes to fundamental rights of EU citizens. If it was a vertical instrument, such as the copyright, I would be the first one and I have been very vocal, not only in the DSA debate, but when it comes to creative industry, when it comes to publishers, and when it comes to even taking a step ahead from even the fundamental um, protection under Article 15 and under the Copyright Directive per se, we should take it. But ultimately, when we're speaking of a horizontal piece of legislation such as this that we are discussing right now, I think that state downs could pose uh, a number of issues, especially when it comes to fundamental rights. Absolutely, it's such a, a sensitive issue. Uh, and just for our, our audience, obviously, refer back to state art within Article 17 just refers to user uploaded content sites, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, the horizontal instrument of DSA, is, as Alex was mentioning, is crossing all intellectual property rights. So everything to do with uh, patents and trademarks, uh, which is an incredibly impossible challenge to, to make action on. However, with copyright, I think the message we always convey to the institutions is that automated content recognition technology has been around for 21 years in Europe and it's actually in place on all of these services because that technology is not just how notice in action works, but it's also how Google search engines, they use that technology, of course, to recognize music so that they can get ad rev. And uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just trying to hold certain services uh, to use the technologies they already have uh, to, to, to notice and take down illegal content. But indeed, it's a fascinating and tremendously complex issue within the Parliament uh, for the year ahead. Um, Ricardo, perhaps your perspective uh, in the Council, please. We see huge divisions across Europe uh, in, uh, on this very sensitive topic. Uh, what's your perspective? Well, um, it's true that uh, although the, the proposal does not provide for, for state down mechanisms or very specific timeframes for removal of content, um, it's true, but we will see how it will evolve in the negotiations because um, what I can tell you is that so far we saw some member states uh, pushing for and insisting on these points, on having a more clear um, uh, I would say wording on 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 the, the, the possibility of state down mechanisms in, to be included in the in the proposal. Uh, if you ask me if it will be one of the elephants in the room, for sure, it will be one, uh, 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 and it will be very controversial, I would say. But anyway, and um, Alex very well explained the, the reasons why, um, due to the horizontality of the proposal, why there are some risks associated to have a. Uh, to implement a state down mechanism. But anyway, uh, there are some other reasons that have been, uh, and your industry 
knows it very well in the in a in a different direction. Anyway, in any case, um, I think that and I believe that harmonizing notice and action together with several additional obligations to uh, to, to to platforms is a very important step forward uh, in this regard too. Eh? Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that the notice and, and takedown will be applicable to all hosting services platforms um, with no carving out for SMEs, for instance. This is also uh, an, important, an important step. Another thing that has been mentioned um, and discussed is that within the scope of the DSA, um, the online platforms must communicate in a very transparent manner their terms and conditions, which so far has not been very clear to all of us as users, consumers, business customers, whatever. Um, and according to those uh, transparent uh, terms and conditions uh, to which they can make removal decisions or, or, or about content or, uh, or users, it means that with the DSA, the platforms will have to explain, explain very well to users the reasons why they decide to keep or remove the content um, or their account. Uh, and this is uh, also uh, something that it's, that it's important. Note that there are, there are something that is also new, the, the idea of the concept of trusted flaggers for detecting illegal content. And it will also enhance uh, some, um, I would say, pre-enforcement mechanisms or, to, or for, the, for the, the, the right owners and, and brand owners to, to protect their own uh, uh, assets, uh, IP assets. Uh, and those trusted flaggers, um, however, this is a provision that sometimes may also raise some doubts uh, because it just so far only provides for the status of trusted flagger for some very specific entities, uh, leaving out of scope some other entities with, for, for example, an extens extensive experience in the matter, uh, especially when we talk about counterfeit products or piracy. Anyway, the concept is there. Now it's for us to work and afterwards the parliament um, on the on the scope of the concept, I would say. Um, and last but not the least, um, there is an, something that is also new on the and it, it will come with the DSA, the enforcement governance. There are new enforcement mechanisms right now, um, and uh, the fact that it established a digital services coordinator, a new EU uh, level supervisory board for digital services. The fact that there are some additional powers for the commission to regard or with regard to the supervision of the very large online platforms. All these, I think that will give to the DSA a much, much more effective, um, I would say, uh, regulatory uh, wo role uh, than we've had um, or we are having uh, with the, the, the e-commerce directive. Um, anyway, in a nutshell, uh, there are several uh, topics that are still very uh, controversial. We've just started one month and a half ago. We still do have very a lot of time ahead of us. But uh, uh, time is also a very critical aspect here. Uh, we cannot take, uh, for example, uh, four years that, like we did on e-privacy um, to tackle those issues. It's impossible. It's unacceptable uh, for both institutions, the Council and the Parliament. And this is, uh, there is a sense of urgency here. And I think that all of us in the, in the parliament and in the council, we are aware of it. And this is also a very positive message that should be uh, shared. Absolutely. And you raise a very interesting point there, but this is not, it's not only about updating the regulatory regime, but having enforcement of good regulation. And indeed ties in in our work to uh, trade policy for Europe and exporting good IPR and copyright standards and digital policy standards through trade policy around the world. We're seeing a lot more uh, digital policy coordination going on at a global level. Uh, Guts, if I may zero in on one uh, specific aspect that was raised in terms of notice and, and action or, or notice and state on, is blocking a, a, a priority? Is it a prominent uh, mechanism? Is it something which, which you see within the industry as a common feature? No, not at all. I think, um, I mean, blocking is sometimes necessary, but uh, as I said earlier, it's our main goal to license and to make our content available, but obviously only through services and platforms that are um, well, willing to pay our writers for it. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, and as far as, so my experience shows that uh, blocking is really mostly an issue of 
let's say, as we call it on the continent, the moral rights issue. So um, putting music into context that is simply not acceptable. Um, still, that must be possible. So that's that's the one thing and constant debates that we, we are having with platforms like YouTube and these kind of things. Um, but here, obviously, we're talking about services that don't want to license at all. That's why we call mm -hmm. them illegal. Um, so, and if there's someone who simply doesn't want to play by the rules, want to use our content, but doesn't want to license, then of course, blocking is the thing we would want to do. Um, for this, we would need to know who are they, um, how can we contact them? So I'm very pleased to hear that, uh, um, Ricardo, you emphasize the fact that you want to regulate. That's important. I think uh, it's we've seen it years now that uh, these rules or self-regulation doesn't really work for us. So that's an important point. Um, but then we also need to make sure that uh, we get the data of the users so we can actually um, prosecute. And that's the point of transparency, obviously, and coming in. It's all interconnected indeed. Thank you, Götz. Uh, I'm very conscious of time. Mr. Salaba, do you have time for one more question before you go to vote? Yes, because I have to intervene in a couple of minutes in the Committee of Petitions, but I can take the last question. Very quickly, and you can bolt after that. Uh, just quickly, we see the issue of Good Samaritan clauses and liability exemptions. Uh, many of the digital services are now engaged in European uh, regulation making. They ignored it for about a decade. Now they're involved. They want liability exemptions. Uh, how do you see this developing uh, in terms of good Samaritan clauses, liability exemptions? Is there appetite for that within the parliament? Uh, do you think that it's fair to ask for it? Again, this was also one of the biggest discussions that we had even during the negotiations. Uh, it was a, a political item in our report that was discussed for weeks, try to find uh, the right text and the right balance. If you ask me directly, on a personal point of view and my position from day one of the negotiations, I am very skeptical of a good Samaritan system. I am very, very, very skeptical of trying to replicate a system which there are already pressures in the US to do away with and replicated it under the uh, EU system. From our end, although, as I said in my introductory remarks, uh, I think that the liability exemptions are important for the ecosystem. At the same time, our aim is not to basically create an environment of more self-regulation by big techs, by big tech companies, uh, an environment whereby these big tech giants dictate the regulatory environment that they have to function it themselves. So if we continue and if we go in the direction of replicating the US Good Samaritan system under the European system, I think that we would end up with a system which is more lax, with a system whereby um, illegal Ill illegality and illegal content would be bypassed uh, throughout, throughout uh, our rules. So I am not a big fan when it comes to um, the, the Good Samaritan. Uh, and I don't believe that this should be replicated under our system in the DSA. We should build up uh, a system which is future-proof, which can tackle the issues that we have in hand today, and we have to preempt some of the issues that will crop up also during the past, during the next few years. So I don't think that we should copy uh, a system which has already failed in other continents when it comes to Good Samaritan. I am not a big fan when it comes to Good Samaritan. It's clear and unambiguous and we're delighted to hear it. Uh, at the end of the day, there should be no carve-outs for uh, the return which is due to creators' work and to their arts and uh, particularly on the digital sphere. So thank you for such a robust and unambiguous message. Um, we're very conscious you've been very generous with your time. If you do have to leave, uh, please do so. Um, I will uh, just, if you, you have to leave now, just now. Yes. I, I have Let me just say thank you so time. much for a wonderful presentation and uh, thank you for your ongoing work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Ricardo, if we may just uh, ask you your perspective on the Council. Obviously, there's been a lot of political pressure uh, engaged by many of digital services to say if we take our own steps, we should be exempt. We should have access to Good Samaritans. It sounds very benign. Uh, 
how do you see the dynamics within the 27 member state governments for a good Samaritan clause? Well, uh, the Commission has, has been stating that, uh, that and several times that, that it's important to keep the li limited liability regime separated and independent from due diligence uh, obligations. And uh, this means that uh, if, uh, if a platform fails to comply with a due diligence obligation, it doesn't mean that it will lose the liability exemption, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is a lot in line with exactly some of the explanations that, I'll, uh, that already Alex mentioned on the, on the horizontality of the, the proposal, which means that it's to avoid over removals um, which could have negative impacts on fundamental rights. This is one approach that this is the commission approach. Um, but, um, but because in fact, to, to be very clear, the DSA should be understood as providing the conditions for the exception to the liability, right? That's, that's, that's the, the subject. The DSA does not intend to define what the liability is because uh, uh, it, it, it has been left to, to, to the national and sectorial legislations, right? But um, it's true, it's also true that Article 6 of the DSA has been already subject of a big, big discussion. Um, the objective is, uh, I would say, to remove one of the arguments that have been used for the inaction of, of, of the operators. Uh, but the article, once again, being very transparent, may raise some, some doubts. Some member states have already raised uh, their doubts. Uh, and I think that it will be subject of a great, great discussion um, during the, the upcoming months, to be, very, to be very clear with you. That's, that's tremendously clear. Thank you very much indeed, Ricardo. We have um, uh, some questions from our attendees. Um, we have uh, Sam Shemtob, perhaps our colleagues in the staff and the SCP staff can unmute. Sam, if you would like to ask your question, uh, directly via the microphone. Otherwise, I will read it out. Sam, are you there? Yeah, just uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hi, Sam. Oh, hi, thanks for uh, accepting my question. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit garbled. Um, it is a question about what you've just um, said, Ricardo, which is the DSA's ability to clarify exceptions to uh, the, the liability framework. Um, and, and it is just that, it's, it's asking where exactly, it is asking for clarity. Um, I, 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 I come from uh, an organization that is uh, working against ticket touting, where we have some very clear bad actors whose business is involved in in, in the lines in between different member states rules, etc., they, they are basically exploiting um, uh, gaps in the law. Um, and um, as, as I say in my question, I, I think some of the provisions of the DSA so far are, are excellent. Uh, know your business customer, notice and action, transparency provisions, reporting, etc. I'm a little unclear. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a little unclear uh, over whether the DSA will provide clarity in terms of the liability framework, especially with regard to um, active uh, platforms that um, advertise that that place some order in the listings, etc. I just wonder whether you can help clarify that. Well, Sam, um, thank you very much for your question. As, as I've mentioned, um, this is subject of a great discussion so far within the the, the, the group. Um, to be very honest, due to the horizontality of the proposal, I can tell you that I've been invited as chair of the internal market uh, to attend um, a lot of other working parties uh, meetings. This morning I've attended two different ones um, on, on, 
on COSI, for example, and other one on trade. It means that home affairs, justice issues, and also trade. Yesterday on transatlantic relations, just it means that there is a lot of uh, opinions popping up uh, in the, regard, regarding the, 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 the DSA and especially the different approaches that to the, due to the horizontality of the proposal it, it, uh, it, it, it provokes that. But for, it's also important to, to, to note that the DSA introduced a lot of, uh, for example, uh, new rules to address the systemic role uh, of uh, platforms uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 in that regard, uh, it's very important because we are normally taught about the biggest, the big risks are uh, in a very specific kind and nature of, of, of platforms, the very large ones. Um, and the fact that they do have now additional and a great set, a big set of additional due diligence obligations, I think that it will for sure not just enhance the mechanisms to avoid those kind of, 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 um, of e illegalities, uh, but also help uh, the enforcement uh, authorities to also uh, do it. Um, but once again, uh, this is, is still subject to a, to a great discussion. I think that it's quite early uh, for us to, to tell if, uh, if, uh, if all the problems that you've mentioned are going to be solved uh, by the DSA. It means there is the aim. But like Alex said, uh, we cannot expect that the DSA is a silver bullet to solve all the problems uh, of the world. But I think that there are, and that, 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 that some of important, very important aspects were already being introduced um, uh, so far. Thank you. Yes, clearly. Thank you. And just to point out, Simon, that uh, of course, one of the great benefits of European legislation is harmonization across the member states. And there is the unfair contract terms directive already in place. Uh, so sites like Viagogo, you mentioned selling uh, unfair sites, if those are contract terms are found to be illegal as they were in last week, that should apply uh, across Europe. And there is legislation in place already on unfair contract terms. And indeed the DSA will tackle active sites, which provide access to illegal content. And for us illegal, of course, is counterfeit or unlicensed. So lots of road left to run. Uh, I'm really conscious of time. Uh, I know that um, uh, Ricardo, your diary is just about as overbooked as it gets. You've been very generous with your time thus far. Uh, we wish you good luck for your discussions with the 27 member states. We thank you for your work thus far. And uh, we hope to maybe see you back again to speak to our membership uh, in the near future as this really interesting topic continues. John, thank you very much. It, I, it was really a great pleasure to, to, to share my time with you and some of the thoughts. One last message. Um, don't have any kind of doubt that the DSA uh, is not a priority for the Portuguese presidency, because it is. It's, it is, I would say, when we talk about the digital, the priority. That's why, to give you an idea, um, our hectic days <laughs> became, uh, it's amazing because we are having on average two meetings per week, which you can imagine, it's really a lot just on the on DSA. And we are setting really a very fast pace in order to deliver um, the best uh, progress report uh, by May uh, and leave to the ministers at the Compent Council uh, a really detailed picture on how the political guidance is needed for the incoming presidencies to really um, start, um, I would say, or become much closer to a general approach, because time here is, I would say, absolutely critical. I mean, if only all politicians and diplomats and, and technicians had such dedication, we see this on a daily basis, uh, getting consensus amongst 27 different national governments in your role as a presidency is, it's really quite a phenomenal task. So thank you for your dedication to it. And I think everyone in the audience can see what Ricardo and Alex are doing. Uh, very often, uh, politicians and leading institutional workers don't get enough credit. Uh, we're very grateful. Obrigado. Um, Gertz as well, too. Thank you very much for your input. Always great to see you. And uh, no doubt we'll be calling you back uh, to reappear on this topic, if I may. Uh, we will repeat this because we've certainly got lots of room to run. May I just before we close flag our upcoming editions? So perhaps as member Al Medina, if you could bring up uh, the advertisements, excuse us for uh, a little plug. 
Uh, these are our upcoming series. Uh, on March 8th, we have a fantastic event coming up. Uh, it's part of our digital series. It's to celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, we're hosting this in conjunction with uh, UK MPA, so our national trade body in the UK, and also in conjunction with Music Publishers Canada, uh, our trade body there in Canada, both members of ICMP and Fantastic uh, Advocates and all things copyright. So you can see the panel there, I hope, on your screen. Uh, starting 6 p.m. for those of us in Europe, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, uh, March uh, 8th, and we really hope to see you there. There's a registration uh, link in the chat box there via the Eventbrite, so take the time now to sign up and put it in your diary. Uh, following that, just a couple of days later, we have a fascinating debate about music data and systems, so how the modern copyright digital framework actually works on a technical level. And we're delighted to be joined by senior executives from Orpheum and DDEX, the global standardization body. So in your diary for March 10th, please. We will also have two further events. Uh, one is on publishing and collecting societies, the latest projects. So touching everything from uh, standardized global cue sheets. And that will be held in late March, date to be confirmed. And finally, we will flag that classical and tech, their twin evolutions. This is a fascinating area of the music business, and we'll be hosting that event in April. Uh, all that's left to say is that these things don't happen smooth, so hopefully so smoothly by, by accident. There's been a tremendous amount of work done by our uh, staff colleagues in the Brussels office, uh, Islam Aksoy, who's in charge of ICP events, and Anadina Velasco, who of course leads in public policy, and Mark Kyle, uh, who is our new and learning of a very, very uh, steep curve uh, with aplomb. Uh, Mark Kyle, our intern as well too, who've put together today's event. So a really warm thank you to all of you from all of ICMP for your Yes, work. thank you very much. So with that, I think we're bang on the hour. Uh, time to jump to our next meeting, folks at ICMP. We're glad to see you all joining and we look to see you very soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.